I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of sh come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to be what was left over I put towards my dreaming But the only thing in life that has meaning Are the things you gotta work for, believe me Take into your hands a plan Your own hands can land your own brand And damn, I feel like no one takes accountability They want the credibility Convincingly unwilling to put in the f hours It takes to get some power Don't be f***ing sour Take a cold shower Scream until you're louder Work until you're prouder And f*** all the doubters They're just your downers I swear to God they all let me down I always fought I can tell you that Seven years after Freddie Gray that was 2015, spring, April, May. This is 2022. Communities like Santan all we saw then and now in terms of investment was a renovated Western District Police Station and a new funeral home. That's what West Baltimore got. A new police station and a new funeral home. What kind of optics are they? Was Freddie Gray any different than 1968 Baltimore riots? Dr. King's passing, killing, murder? Is it the same? Uh, no. I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, people who are, are doing uh, violence and burning, that's, you know, it's all that's the same. Uh, but the point is, is what was the cause and what were they attempting to register? Um, I always thought just to wear the crown. I won't stop till they hear me now. I won't stop till I wear the crown. First name's Donnie, last name's Glover, in it to win it for the long haul baby. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, Monday, September the 12th, and we've got a thing or two to discuss. First of all, do check out our websites, bemorenews.com, the news before the news where we uncover the truth. We are now in our 20th year as of August 9th. Woohoo. Also, we have blackusa.news which features a number of shows from around the country, including New York, Baltimore, D.C., Atlanta, and Oakland. If you would like a show, if you think you have what it takes, if you've got the right stuff, just email us. And let's talk about it. Editor at BlackUSA.news. Uh, many thank you to our sponsors. Okay, we're on the air. You're interrupting our broadcast thank you um black people and other people around the world just want to tell you it's amazing those of us who don't know history if you want to acknowledge a queen then do your damn homework Stop celebrating people who hate you. It's called Stockholm Syndrome or Patty Hearst Syndrome. Do your history. You want to talk about a queen? Go to Ethiopia. Call Queen Latifah. Call my mama. You want to tell me about a queen? Tell me about a real queen. Okay? Do your homework. Learn your history. Ethiopia got queens. Matter of fact, queens from around the world, including the one that just kicked the bow down to them. We don't know our history too often. We don't know that certain powers, European, split up Africa like a, like a bag of potato chips. Everybody playing snatch pop. The only country that wasn't taken, wasn't colonized, was Ethiopia. 
arguably you could say the same for Liberia, Sierra Leone. Know your history. Stop falling for the okie doke. Calling that girl Megan out her name. And then y'all gonna celebrate her. Who are you trying to get points with? These people don't like you. We don't think. Uh, what else? Oh. Now, for baseball season, I get it. Because you might catch me in the Yankees jersey. I like the Yankees for the very thing that's going on right now with Lamar. Again, we got to know our history. Did you know that Frank Robinson, one of the most famous Orioles of all time, almost didn't play here? We forget all about Kirk Flood. Kurt Flood sued American League Baseball and won. And as a result, free agency came about. The NFL followed suit the following year because Kurt Flood didn't want to feel like a slave. And that's exactly what Lamar is experiencing right now. They paid Joe Wacko, who got his hind parts waxed yesterday. A boatload of money, but they questioned paying Lamar. That's how I see it. I could be wrong. I'm sure a lot of you know contracts better than me. But we know common sense. And if they don't want to pay Lamar, I highly suggest he goes somewhere where they will. They're paying bums more money. Uh, what else I want to tell you? Oh, I started off talking about if you are not a rave, uh, if you, you know, I, I understand people wearing other jerseys. But you wearing a Jets jersey in Baltimore, you got to feel like it. Real crazy. Okay, without further ado, we're going to get to the boxing ring. I don't know if I ever told you, I did a little bit of boxing up at North and Utah. It was called uh, Operation Champ. Back in the day, met some of the greats. Good morning, Mike Tampa Bay in the house. Sister, no. She know the history. You know it. But there was some wonderful uh, boxing instructors up there at Utah Gardens, including Coach Leon. But well, we have a gentleman right here who is no slouch, heavyweighter, Malik Titus. Malik, good morning. How you doing? Good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, the pleasure's all mine. The pleasure's all mine. Where you from, Malik? I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I grew up in a Santa Wish I show, uh neighborhood. That's where I live at now, Sandtown. We see your daddy every day, Mr. Titus. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'm. It's, it's always a pleasure having him as a dad. You know, he always been like inspirational, um, as far as like you know, just boxing and life, and just overall, just like having a good person that I have by my side, just called dad. So, how'd you get into boxing, Malik? Well, honestly, it was like a bond first with my father. I was three years old, and like um, it was a it was a boxing program called You My Boxing Gym, and it did. Yeah. McDowell. Yes, sir. And at this time it was on it was located on North Avenue. So we live we, we, we live in the Gilmore Home Project. So like I was about three years old and like me and my dad he took me there. And like I knew I knew what it was, but like uh instead of going up the steps, I could smell like this sweat and like this leather, like it's like a mixture of like foam. And then I just smell I just hear like I hear like a, a jump rope, I hear like I hear like a speed bag, and I hear like somebody hitting a bag. And like as a kid, like I don't know what's going on upstairs, but I know I, I gotta get up there. Like I gotta, I gotta see what's going on. So like you know he's like a real old kid going up these steps. He's like like what's going on up there? What's going on up there? And I see like you know people hitting a bag. You know people jump rope. And I'm like I just fell in love with it right from there. So like um I was about like three four years old, and I remember like um just watching going to like watching the fight. They had like fights outside. Uh, you more boxing them like in the summertime. It'd be, like outside like all the neighborhood people come come and watch. And I was like so young like I couldn't I couldn't box yet. I had to be eight years old. So I just started crying like I did. I want to box. I want to box. I want to box. And he was like, you know, you got to wait you eat. He's like, I was like, I don't care. I want to box now. So uh, fast forward um, about like 11. Um, at this point, I'm not really like that interested in boxing no more. I want to play football. And I was always an old weight kid. So uh, my dad, he gave me a suggestion. Like, he said, let's go to the gym, you know, and work out at the boxing gym. He's like, you don't got to box. Just do it. And then, like, that'll help you leave in football. Cause I kept trying to lose weight. But, you know, like this time, like we had Pop Warner. So, like, it was like an age. It was like a weight limit. So I'm about like 11, like 190, weight limit, like 160. Like 170, so like I'm like, I'm like 11 year old kid trying to lose 20, 30 pounds. So um, I know I end up going to the gym at the boxing gym, and at this point I'm about 11, going on 12, and 
I thought I'd get like the passion back for boxing again. And like it all started from me just bonding with my dad and my uh, and my granddad. So what schools did you go to, Malik? Um, I went to well at this and now we call like in middle school, and now we call like Saint Saint Town Winchester. Um, but at that, at that point it called um it called Georgie Cowson at, at that point. So I always grew up I always went to like schools in the neighborhood. But for us like uh graduated, I went to like Garrison Middle School for uh, eighth grade. I graduated there and I graduated high school at Forest Park High School. Um at this year I went to like uh University of Maryland Eastern Shore for a year and then I went to like CCBC. And I thought and I was like, you know, college not really for me. And I it's like I thought it was like it was more like a shift where like should I like pursue boxing or should I just pursue education? And like even like some people say you should, you should pursue both. But uh, I kind of um, I wanted like take the uh, the boxing route because I just saw like felt like where I was going at in life. I feel like you know boxing would be more beneficial to me at that moment. You know you can always go to school. Uh, yes, sir. In fact, I'm about to take a class now. It's it's not you know school. That's a lifelong journey, depending on what you what you're focused on. So I want to go back to uh, elementary school. You mentioned George G. Kelson. You mentioned Sandtown. Yes, sir. <laughs> and there's no way I can't at least tell people a little bit about George Kelson. Okay. Now, years ago, probably, I guess, before you were born, ran on Calhoun Street in the 1300 block, there was a funeral home. It's gone now. But that was the Kelson funeral home. You still with me? Yes, sir. And uh, Mr. Bailey owned it at the time, but George Kelson, the man they named the school after, was a local funeral director. And that's special to me because my dad was a funeral director. Wow. But he employed many people in Sandtown. So right up there at that corner, uh, Pressman and Calhoun, you got the Odyssey across the street. That's a whole little community right there, Pressman and Calhoun. Everybody know everybody, including your dad. Your dad is a fixture in this community, but so was Mr. Kelson. And, and th those were the days when we did a better job, I think, looking out for each other. So big ups in heaven to Mr. George Kelson. So you went to Umar. Tell me about Marvin McDowell. Well, I met him. Uh, I guess I met met him when I was like a kid, and like even like now, like um, I currently don't. I currently don't train there. Like when I started boxing, I went to Upton Boxing Gym on uh, Avenue Market. Um, but me, me and Mister Ma, we had like a great connection. Like I always see him. Like I go to the gym sometimes train, or like I just see him like in that, around the neighborhood. And like he, he always been like a good person. Like you know, where like not just in boxing. Like he really been on like community development, and like as saying like people that look like me that's older than me. Uh, that's really great to me because like um. I see that like a lot of times, like people. I'm 25. A lot of people, like in my age group, that's going to become successful. Their their idea of like success is not, you know, living in Baltimore, and that's nothing wrong with that. But it's it's also like a, a idea of like not giving back, where like their idea of like what success mean and like it's getting away from Baltimore City because they have a fear of like you know like especially like young like black men they have a fear like if I become successful you know I can if I can I come back here you know I might get robbed I might get killed you know uh, because like maybe like in, in, uh, envy and jealousy. But uh, with me, like, I have, like, a different approach of it. Like, I knew, like, growing up, you know, a lot of kids, I knew, like, some kids, they didn't want to sell drugs. They didn't want to, like, um, you know, hang on the street. Like, they was actually, like, good, you know, good young men. But because, like, so much of the, um, so much of, the, like, the stereotypical, like, you know, Baltimore, inner city. Peer um, pressure. Yeah, peer pressure. And just, like, overall, just, like, um, I feel like a lot of, like, young men that's not into, into the street life get overlooked. And I want to, like, come back and reach those young men. Because like I know like a lot of times like people uh, they always talk like like uh, crime pre prevention, but a lot of people don't ever talk about like you know the young men that don't they just want to go to school and just want to like have a have a good life. You know they they still they still in a, a rough environment also. So I want to like um, start a male initiative program that reaching like middle middle school age kids, uh, and like this I want to use my the funding I'm gonna have with boxing to fund to fund that program. And one one thing I want to do is like um, a lot of people might say like you know like. Um, when they talk about community development, like well, why you keep on trying to develop like in the city, but I feel like um you kind of like trying to beautify around it where like kids can understand like you know like just because just because I live like in a rough neighborhood, you know like you got you know you got I got like crack fiends on the corner, you know you got drug dealers, like that don't mean like I have to like internalize that, 
And um, I want to give kids like an opportunity, like have like take like trips, you know, weekend trips. And like, I feel like me having like the fun I can get with boxing, that can actually like fund that where I don't have to worry about like a lot of times, like um, I was always on like commercial boards, like for example, like with Broco Baltimore. And like, I saw like, a lot of times, like it was like the funding, like, you know, we need donations, we need donations. But like, sometimes it's kind of hard to like ask like people that live in poverty for the donations. So like uh, what my, well, what I would like to do is I would like to like, when I become like, you know, a great boxer, I want to use my money that I make and fund my own, my own vision. Well, that's a beautiful vision, Malik. I appreciate it. They say Sandtown's a tough neighborhood. You think Sandtown's a tough neighborhood? Uh, yes, sir. Like growing up, you know, like, like it was rough. You know, I was an old weight kid. You know, I was a shy kid, you know, low self-esteem. And, you know, like just that, just that alone, you know, like, you always gonna get picked on. You always, and me being a big stature guy, it's always gonna be like, um, you gonna get jumped, you know. So like growing up, um, I remember like I was about like twelve years old when I started like really like getting serious and like the box like going like every day, and I remember like how like how safe I felt going to the boxing gym and just being there and fighting a couple hours. Like I felt more safer there than sometimes I did home, where it's like you know like, um, and not saying like I didn't have a good a good upbringing at home or anything like that. But it's just like a safetyness of like just a gym where it's like um you know you go outside your neighborhood you I got I gotta worry about somebody trying to jump me. I want to you know like but it's more like or even going to school, you gotta worry about somebody trying to pick on you. But it's like just like the safety of boxing, where it's like, you know, like let's say you're going to like a spar match or something, at least it's a one on one person, you know, you're not getting jumped, you're not getting you know where no weapons going on. You know, so boxing is like, you know, it's one on one, you know. If you get you know, you get your, your tail whip, at least it's like you shake your hands and then you keep it moving, you know. But like you know, on the street, you know, somebody might, you know, they might get into allocation, somebody lose, and they want to get a gun, they want to get a knife, they want to get get other people. So like with boxing, it's like the safetyness of it. And I know it's like kind of rough talking about like a dangerous sport of boxing, but with me, it was just like almost like a safety net where I could just like go to and just like uh, relax and just and to a degree like be at peace. I went to Lamel. We had to fight every day. <laughs> I wasn't a big fella like you. I was a little fella. <laughs> yeah, West Baltimore make you fight, and they will bank you in West Baltimore. Yeah, <laughs> but see, those are suckers because they can't fight it up. And those people that bank, you you know, you're gonna see them again by themselves. Yes, sir. So you go from Umar. See, Umar, that's when they were on North Avenue. Do you remember when Umar was on Fulton Avenue? Yes, that's actually that, that's actually when I went there. I was three years old, and it was on it was on Fulton Avenue. I got the I got the uh, I got the the streets messed up. It was I was I went there. And that's when I I went to the steps, and I felt you know I had like I didn't know what was going up there, but you know I had to check and see what's going on. You but know? you saw that big boxing ring in there. Uh yes, sir. That's what I remember on Fulton Avenue. That the boxing ring. I mean, the place wasn't that big, but the boxing ring. You can't forget that boxing ring. Yeah. Did you know? There was a boxing ring, I mean, a boxing gym on McKean Avenue, about 50 feet below North Avenue. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Some of the old heads, I mean, because everybody knows everybody, but right there in, Mc, in McKean Alley, that's that little, it's, it's, it's a little narrow street. But I used to go in there often way back when we had the Sandtown newspaper to cover some of the fighters. I think uh, Petaway came through, did some boxing through there. Did you ever box over East, over uh, Mac Lewis? Well, like, uh, it, well, I, well, I try to like a sister gym. So, like, we go there, like, sometimes, like, every other week to, like, train um, and spar. But so it's, like, I definitely got, like, a good connection, like, uh, with Coach Warren and other coaches that, uh, that run the program. It's really like a really a really like family oriented like community oriented gym. That's what like I like about it, and uh, that's one thing I like about like for example like growing up, and like just seeing like you know positive you know black men doing trying to make a difference. Like that's what that makes one like fun, even more because like even like um pe even though we don't we don't change the whole you know the whole dynamic of Baltimore. Let's say like we probably don't I probably don't do it in my generation, but I would like to like plant seeds where like. Kids can not necessarily so. It just might happen on your gener in your generation. I'm not saying it in like a um in like a way of saying like you know being discouraged, but I will. What I meant by that was more like I would like to like plant seeds to leave my mark, regardless. Um, and eventually I would love to, like something like that to change. But if it don't, I would like to plant seeds for maybe the next generation to carry on. We need a LeBron James. 
Let me ask you this. Do you know Chu Smith? I uh, know, sir. I'm sorry. I got to connect you to your homeboy. Okay. Chu Smith come out of Gilmore Homes. He went on to become a Harlem Globetrotter. And now he is in charge. He had, he's been granted the old Green Spring Middle School. He has that whole building and he's building a community. We just had him on the show last week, but he's from Sandtown. And this is what I'm, I'm pushing to you. As long as you got the vision for what you want to see, I would like to connect you with some people who should be helping you achieve that vision. See, everybody talk about Sandtown but nobody helps Santana. They come here, Malik. We call it poverty pimps. They come holding bags of money. And we think we're going to get that money in our community, but it's all a game. Floyd Mayweather. What do you think about Floyd Mayweather? Well, I feel like uh, he definitely like, really a great, like, dedicated boxer. And like uh, I know, like sometimes, like people they they, they might think of like the found lawyers of them, like you know, the big house and the big cars. But like you know, the fighter, like I know, like just like the slim margin, like how a person can get there. You know, it's like a slim, that's like a one in a million chance. You know, so like I would like that's like judge the man, like how he live his life. But I would, I would, I look at it for us, like um, I know, like for us, like being a fighter, like that's like a one in a million chance a person will ever make that type of money. Have you fighter. ever met him? Uh no, sir. What? Yeah, I never. I went to a gym. Uh, I was in Vegas probably like about like seven years ago, but I never actually like physically met him. You are going to meet Floyd Mayweather. You. Yeah, I know. I'm, I know. I'm gonna meet him eventually. You're gonna meet him sooner than you think. Okay. Just have your plan together. I appreciate it. Your daddy. I see your daddy every day. That's why we had to do this interview because I felt guilty at some point. <laughs> Every time I see him, my son boxing. Like, what's your next fight, by the way? I'm fighting at, uh, September 24th at the Patapsco Arena. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Tell him about it. Uh, yes, sir. So, like, as a professional fighter, I'm currently 7 0 with seven knockouts. Um, and I, I want to, this is my first time actually fighting in Baltimore as a professional. And as an amateur, you know, I never fought here in about 10 years. So, like, um, as an amateur, I was like on like traveling teams, like, always on gas teams. So, I travel throughout the country. Like competing in like various national tournaments, like, like winning tournaments throughout around the country. So like to me, like fighting here in Baltimore next week and like special to me because like I wanted the people to be able to support me, like fuck like family, and not just like um miss my family, just like people that's like trying to get around like the next great professional boxer, heavyweight that's in, from Baltimore that's homegrown, you know, especially like in heavyweight division right now, you know, like it's starting to become a little bit more booming, and I want to bring this heavyweight championships back to Baltimore, and I want to give people like um the next champion. Uh, pr uh, prior to Hassan Rock, man. And I'm not sure position how, like, what's his impact on the city, but I want to have, like, a great impact on the city. For us, like, um, I know, like, me becoming, like, a world champion, specifically on the spiritual heavyweight champion of the world, that's going to be, like, a great look for, like, just the city in general. Malik, you already a world champion. Appreciate you. I mean that. Thank you. I know you got to do what you got to do, but who you are right now, we love that. You get out there and make all the millions. You, you might put Baltimore in your rear view mirror. <laughs> but I don't think so. Your daddy, your daddy loves this community. See, and see, that's the difference. We have people who say they love Baltimore, but we got people who really do love Baltimore. Because people will say anything for money. And I don't see you as that kind of person. Uh, and yeah. like LeBron, I imagine you're going to have a real strong team of people around you so that you can invest wisely. And let me tell you this, Malik, you can't give people something. You got to make them work for it. Uh, yes, sir. If I just gave you a million dollars, would you appreciate it or would you appreciate it more if you had to work for it? Honestly, I appreciate it more if I had to work for it. And you're going to hold on to it longer. Uh, yes, sir. They said a wise man, they said if, if if a wise man was getting ready to die, what would he leave 
his child, a million dollars or common sense? What do you want? <laughs> I would say, uh, honestly, in this, in this economy, I would say the million dollars, but also common sense as well. But if you ain't got no common sense, that million dollars is gone. But if you got common sense, you gonna get that money. Yes, sir. We have seen a lot of people come through Baltimore. They become rich and then they become broke. Look at the NFL. They don't talk about it, but a lot of those football players from the NFL, by 30, 35, they broke. Yes, yeah, sadly even shorter than that. Yeah. Know? Yeah, so like I think like a lot of times like people don't understand like the competitors of like just being in the NFL as it is, you know, every year is a draft, you know. And, like it's a slim, it's a slim margin of like young men that try to take your spot every year. So like, you know, in the NFL, you know, you got like a, a really, a really short window to perform, especially like getting out your rookie rich, rich contract or free entry contract. You know, after that, you know, it's, it's an exile. I was right there to take the spot, you know, <laughs> that's like, you know, in boxing like that also, but like, it's not the competitive, like, you know, every year is another guy that's a star in college coming and take my spot, you know, you know, there's always going to be the next guy in boxing that's going to take what you got. But um, I just know like, with me, it's like it's kind of hard. I see a person like get out of like football or something at like 25, 26, and you try to tell these people, like, you know, you got two million dollars, but you got to try to survive that with the ne your next till you die. Like, that's kind of scary, you know. Then somebody probably got you know, got Ferraris, you got the house, trying to look a certain way, you know, and that's that's very like scary. They don't know when your next paycheck gonna go come because you know, at this oh, point, you mean floss and, and you ain't paid the gas and the electric bill, <laughs> yeah. You got, yeah. A Benz, you got a Benz out front, but you living in an apartment. Yeah, like, with me, and I never want to have, like, that, Um, I, I never want to go that route. So, like, at least, like, I know, like, with boxing, you know, it's a very, like, rough sport. But at least with, like, boxing, I know, like, you know, you got guys like Mike Tyson who made money, and, like, they kind of blew it. Sometimes they got it back. But I know with boxing, you know, it's, like, Mike more like. Mike Tyson blew a lot of money. I, I looked them up, sure, <laughs> and they only got 10 mil, and he, he made hundreds, man. So I just know, like, with boxing, like, it's, like, a little different with me because, like, I feel like, you know, like, you're going from, like, four rounds to, like, 12 rounds, you know, like, every like every fight, you know, you're getting steps up, step up, step up. So it's, like, let's say you might fight, make, like, six, like, 50 grand one fight, then next fight you make 200 grand. So it's, like, you don't know when your next paycheck on comes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you got to have other investments. Yes, sir. You need a lawyer. You need a good lawyer. I would highly recommend you search for a good lawyer. Yes, sir. And you had mentioned earlier about boxing versus going to college. I want everybody to go to college because okay. you can handle it. And even though you got a lawyer to read your contracts, you need to read your contract too. Uh, yes, sir. Because you might have a lawyer that's greasy. So you probably want two lawyers. You want one lawyer to do the work and another lawyer to check the work. Yes, sir. Because you are the business. You are the business. Your career, that's the business. So you need a lawyer, an accountant, you need an insurance person. I don't know if they got boxes insurance, but you got to have some insurance to protect you and yes, your sir. livelihood. And you need a, let's see, the banker. Oh, the banker. You need a bank. You need a bank. You need to know some bankers. Probably need several accounts. So the banker, the attorney, the insurance and the, uh, I messed that up. The banker, the accountant, the insurance, and the lawyer. Bail. They call it bail. You can call me up any time. I'll share what I know. Um, I want to say this about Floyd. I've seen Floyd say some things that I look at him like, wow, Floyd, did you just say that? But that's when he's, you know, being his entertainment self. Or not. But when I watch, what I think I see as far as Floyd and Javante Tank Davis. Now, I don't know the particulars and don't want to know. But I see one man 
passing the ball to another man who sees one man with great talent. He sees another man with great talent. Floyd, from what I hear, is tired of the promoters making all the money. Floyd say he running them miles. He doing he doing the heavy bag. He doing the speed bag. He he spawned. Not the promoter. Plus, some of the promoters real clowns. <laughs> and we know about Don King and the money they used to make off of people like Tyson. Floyd ain't having that. And I love that. I love the fact that he's helping empower other people because he could be selfish. And he's, I don't know. That's just what I see. What do you see? Well, definitely like with Floyd, like with me, like I definitely like. A lot of times, like, I see a guy who, like, he made it, he made it to the top. He, like, capitalized more of his talent compared, like, keep giving away more of his money. So, like, I got, like, kind of, like, a similar mindset with that also. You know, like, football boxing, you know, like, you know, you can break your hand. You know, you can't fight again. You know, you get a concussion. You know, your career over. You know, with boxing, like, it's your body. So, you never know like, when your body going to break down. So, you know, eventually, like, you're going to get older. You can't compete anymore. So, you know, with athletes, you know, like, it's like sometimes it can be like a gift and a curse, but you got to make it a gift more than a curse. A curse, you know, you just know like it's like a one in a million opportunity that you're going to be becoming the one that make it. And a lot of guys, you know, you're going to outcompete a lot of guys, you know. Sometimes it might come down to like people liking you. Sometimes people want to invest more into you, but a lot of it's going to come to like who you are as a person and just like what you want to put into the sport, you know. Because for me, I know like, you know, you come under spirit, you know, you got you pretty much one on one, you know, you try to become one of a thousand something other guys who want you know the same opportunity and like um and other guys just want to like actually like put compete in and want to actually want to want to become a world champion you know you want to be you got to be the one that like you know not just become world champion stay there you know i don't i don't want to win a title then lose the next fight you know you kind of i was happened to a sim rock man yeah like i don't want to win it and then we'll lose it again <laughs> how do you beat a clutch code when I watch them Russians, the East European boxers, they seem like they train very seriously. I mean, not just the body, but mentally. I mean, I've watched Klitschko break down a cat, you know, because especially when I see him boxing African-Americans, you got to outthink that cat. What do you think about Klitschko? Well, I feel like... Uh, the brother like Vitalia um Vladimir, like with me, like I like Vladimir a little bit bowing better. Like um with me, like I got like a really good jab. Like I like I like fighters that got like a really great jab. Plus like heavyweights, like big guys who he not gonna like use use his distance. He not I wanna let his right hand go. Like he not he might not have like a lot of like flamboyantness to him, but like he get the job done. You know, he he gets like, you know, he know he understand like box, like even how you said like the mental part, like he he understand like what to do. And I think a lot of it comes down to like knowing who you are as a person. Like, like every athlete got like his limitations. Like he, got, you gotta know your weaknesses also. And I say that's somebody who kind of like understand like his weaknesses as a fighter and also his strengths and like capitalize the most of it. What about discipline? I think like with discipline, like I remember like with the Kliskos, you know, they said they grew up like the Soviet Union, so like you know, in that in that type of in that type of environment, you know. You pretty much like playing a sport, then you go home. Like they talked about how like like they had they like they had like one pair of shoes, you know. They play like they went to school in them pair of shoes, they 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 play sports in them pair of shoes. You know, like like growing up even like in a and like in my neighborhood, you know, like we 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 in poverty, but ain't nobody ain't nobody playing like football in their shoes and their school shoes or something, you know. They got they got they got a couple pairs of shoes, you know, they got a couple, they got the Jordans, they got the new balances. But you know, with with them, they was like that's kinda like stupid to spend money on all this stuff. So I'm like a different, I guess like coming from like a different culture, they had a different mentality, like how money and just like overall, just like, I guess a different way of life. But I feel like first, like with discipline, you know, like in life, I, me like 25, it's like, it's like, it's like a golden age for me right now. You know, like, like I'm young, but like, I actually have like, really had like life experience. Like I'm, I'm not saying like life experience, like I'm like a 40 year old man, but like, I feel like I got like enough life experience. Like I can like really like talk to somebody and they can like understand where I'm coming from. Like me, like right now, understand. Like first, I got realized that I'm a, I'm a human being first, and then like um also like I got SU power that I don't know about. Like I'm still potential, that I'm still learning, and like so like sometimes like people they have like a very high expectation on me, and like for like for the longest I didn't understand why, 
But um, as I'm starting to like learn myself more and it's like, this is who I'm becoming, like this, this I'm Malik Titus and I'm actually having a joy of like becoming Malik Titus. I understand like having a high expectation, like is actually, is actually a gift, you know, cause people looking up to you and they see you as a leader. Well, let me, let me tell you something. You have gone through the Klitschko and go through. You ready? Okay. Vitaly and them ain't grow up in Sandtown. <laughs> I don't know where he grew up, how he grew up, but Sandtown ain't no punk. Nah. You don't know if he would have survived the streets of Sandtown. Nah. Because Sandtown a trip sometime. I remember one time I had an 8 o'clock class up at B Triple C, up Liberty Heights. I was living around on Calhoun Street. I was renting a room, going to college. Man, it was eight. It had to be like seven twenty, seven thirty. I was running late. I should never have signed up for no eight o'clock class. But listen, I took my book. I left something upstairs. I lived on the third floor. I took my book bag off, sat it on the step. I come back. Somebody from Sandtown stole my calculus book. Ah. Uh. I was so angry. I was like, "You can't even do calculus. Why you steal my book?" <laughs> You don't even know where to sell the book back to. <laughs> I was so mad. You've seen things in Sandtown that Klitschko probably ain't seen. Like, honestly, like, with me, it's Good like... Good and bad. Yeah, like, honestly, with me, like, growing up in Sandtown, like, it gave me, like, a different, like, outlook on the world at a young age, where it's like, I saw, like, people just surviving, where it's like, it could be, like, legally and illegally, you know, like, people just trying to make a way to survive, you know, once they sell like, like oh, they selling food stamps. Like people, they I just, I just see people surviving. Like the best way you know how to. So like, well, a lot of people they talk about like looking down on it. Like I mean, I can understand to a degree, but like with me, it's more like understand like where that that survival coming from. This like lack of resources, and, like just trying to survive, um, and just trying to do the best they can of this, making a life. Um, and I know like a lot of people they understand like you know they they are of of the world is not going outside the neighborhood. So they're trying to make the best. They just trying to live the best they can live. And like sometimes that look, that look different from the, from the naked eye, but growing up in a neighborhood, like growing up there, you kind of you kind you kind of can like empathize, understand certain people and their struggles. But from the outside world, it's like you know they sell the drugs, they sell they sell but, they don't. But you you chose not to sell drugs. Uh yes sir. It was a decision I made at eleven. Honestly, I remember like uh, one of my like one of like pretty much my best friends. Like we cool to this day. His name is Malik also, and like I was just sitting on the steps, and he lived in like Pitcher Street, and like. He lived in on Pitcher Street, close to the Avenue Market, and like you know, where he lived, that you know, like drugs were like in and out, like you know, like the, the whole, the whole. Ran there by the bricks. Yeah, he 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 lived there, so I remember I just told him like, yo, I ain't selling, like I ain't selling no dope. Forget that, like forget that, because I just saw like you know like a kids like a couple years older than us, you know like they'll play like they'll play with us, then they probably get like you know 13, 14, 15, around that age, pushing like sixteen. You see him on the corner, and it's like I knew like. It's like a, it's like a, a, a like a cycle would keep coming and coming. And I was just like, yeah, I don't I don't want to do this. Like I was like, it's for me. You Say know? that again, Malik. One minute, one year, y'all hanging out doing what what kids do, and you you notice that all of a sudden they didn't hang out with y'all no more. They started gravitating to the corner. Yeah, and I saw like a lot of times like like for example, like I had a friend like he boxed and like he boxed when I was like. 13, 14, I was 14, he was 13. And like he was like very talented, just natural talented. And like he's 13. And like he like really I'm selling drugs. And I'm like, I'm looking like, yo, just stand in the gym. Like, you know, you're like you got you got free this. And like I'm trying to like like really like talk to him. He said, Man, I got I gotta pay the bills. So I'm like, huh? Like, what you mean you gotta pay the bills? He said, I like, I like you might know what you're doing. She said, Yeah, I I I I'll, I'll pay the bills. So I'm like, you know, a, a kid at 13 should had to go to, like, trying to be the man in the house, you know. And the parents shouldn't be helping them sell drugs. Yeah, so I like, and I just saw like. Because it sounded like the parent had a drug habit. I don't necessarily know they had, a, the, the mother had a drug habit, but I know, like, it was. I guess, I guess I, you're, you're right. Not all, some just greedy. Yeah, so, like, I feel like. I'm not going to have my child selling dope. Yeah, so I saw like a lot of times like the people say about like young black men in Baltimore, just like inner city worldwide, they like to understand if like you know some kids they gotta just grow up, they gotta be a man before they actually become a man, you know. I I know people like that. 
So like, and I know like it's kind of like unfair because like you know, as you get a felony, then like your career, I mean, your life is just pretty much going down the hill at that point. He didn't think it's over already. Yeah, because somebody wasn't there to warn him. I That's ran it. there on the bricks. Ain't nobody ran there with, you know, ain't nobody ran there talking about going to college, going to work. Malik, why do a cat got to get locked up? And then they come home from jail and say, yeah, I got my GED while I was locked up. Why you just don't get your GED now? Why don't you just finish school now? Because finishing school is easier than that GED. That GED ain't no chump. I never had a GED, but I don't, I don't, I know like to me, like school, going to school is enough. And I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to go do nothing else extra compared to like getting, I'd rather, I'd rather just go to high school. I'd rather just, you know, get my diploma and like didn't go to college. But I never, I knew like with me, like I just want to stay on a, like a straight pearl, like, uh, path. And then like, I know like, I know like some people don't have like a print, like parents like my dad, my mom, but, um, you know, like, like we grew up poor, but still, they still instill like morals and values into me. They're like, you know, I people, bet your daddy would have. Beat your buddy, caught yeah. you selling drugs around there, yeah. man. I know I was, you bigger than him now, but yeah. you wasn't always bigger than him. And he looked like he ain't taking no stuff. Yeah, and I always knew that. So, like, I always knew that I can't, like, like, I pretty much can't, like, slip up for real because, like, you know, they. You ain't going to outslick him. Yeah, like, you ain't. <laughs> you can't bring him no okie doke. I see your daddy. He walked these streets. He know. Yeah. So, I always knew, like, the idea of me doing that is just is out the window. So, when you become rich and famous, where are you gonna put this big famous gym? I know you're gonna build a gym. I know you are. Yeah, I want to build in West Baltimore, honestly. <laughs> yeah, because let me tell you something about Umar. Marvin need a new damn gym. Not have told him this. He was up there. He was right on full. Now he up north in Utah. But Marvin said, if he get a new gym, the kids might not appreciate it. But this is what I know. That might be true. But when I go to other communities, when I go to Southeast D.C., they got a wreck over there, Benning Park. Oh, Headbangers? Yeah. Is that the name? It's called Benning, Benning Park. I don't know. That's the nickname, Headbangers Southeast. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called like Headbangers Park. It's, like a, it's a, a very nice gym. It's a, it's a recreation center. I think like Ball Eagle Recreation. But they got lights. Their football field got lights. And it's just a, a rec center. Our rec centers are not like that. They haven't built new recs. Greater Model is the last recreation center I remember in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. All of these people got all of this money, supposedly for our community. Where's that? So I, I, I think our kids deserve the best. Like they built that new Dorothy High School over there, John Eager Howard. My understanding from Coach Rodell is they don't even let the kids in the neighborhood use the school. Oh, wow. So, yeah, we need some people to bring some common sense to our community. And if you get famous, watch out for all the new friends you're going to get. Because <laughs> they ain't your friend. Okay, so um, this big fight, let's put the promo out there. Yes, it's sir. going to 24th. A September, we at the Patapsco Arena. Um, the tickets you can like reach out to me at like um even my I'll give like my number. Well, hold, hold up, let's 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 put your contact information out there. What you want me to put a, a phone number or website? Yeah, you put my phone number and also like my uh, Instagram also. Okay, so let's Malik fight us. You're a heavyweight. Yes, sir, I'm six five two sixty. I met Muhammad Ali right up there at Coppin State. He's one of the nicest people. He could go anywhere in the world, and he ain't need no bodyguard. Wherever he went, he ain't need no bodyguard. That's great. Okay. I got a little sidetracked. What's the phone That's number? Cool. My phone number is going to be 443-991-3966. IG? It's going to be um King underscore Elite. So like you can just type in like my full name, M-A-L-I-K-T-I-T-U-S, and it'll pop up. Okay, but what is it on IG? You got me started. King underscore Leak. Yes, sir. L E A K. Yes, and you spell it with it with two G's and two K's. I knew it was something. Okay. <laughs> All 
How's that? Is that right? Yes, sir. And I should put the date on there. Let me put the date on there. September. This is next Saturday. Yes, sir. And uh, the tickets are $60 for general admission and uh, $120 for VIPs. And they can reach out to me uh, for tickets. I might have to come out there with a press pass. You know, I'm I'm the press. I don't pay to go nowhere. I don't pay to go <laughs> nowhere. Okay. Including the White House. I'm on my way there tomorrow, I think. Okay, September 24th. $60, Malik Titus Heavyweight. That's the phone number. You can follow him on Instagram. Uh, what's Before you go, I need some advice for the young people in Sandtown. All right, that's the that's advice I would love to give. Um, with me, it's like, I just reach out to like mentors. Sometimes like like kids like in my generation, like a little younger, you know, like we kind of like in an urban, like urban, I guess like hip hop. Where like you know it's, it's sometimes up like you know killing and stuff like that, but like I just like like try to reach out like positivity, like cause I feel like it's actually like mentors some in a way are there you know, and like with me like my dad like he always understood to me like you know like it take like a village to raise a kid, so like growing up like school and stuff I always knew like it's, if people actually just there to help me sometimes like we talk about, like people, the teachers don't like us or, like, and in some degree it's like that kind of true but I was like I was I was always able to find like mentors like in school. Or like just outside in the community, outside of my household. What if it's like a what if like a sports coach or like just like a, a person like in the neighborhood who's just trying to give me advice to stay on the right path. So like I would just like just don't just like stay away from like negativity. I know like sometimes that's kinda that can be a little hard where it's like always in your face. But like it is like positivity there if you're actually like looking for it. Like I feel like the person I look for opportunity, even like a even like a limited environment, it it it's it gonna be something there because like a lot of people aren't aren't looking for opportunities. I think I think I hope I could uh, hopefully I uh, paraphrase that correctly. Oh, you did just fine. Like for example, mm -hmm, I'm sorry. Like for example, I went to Forest Park High School. That's where I grew up from. You know, like Forest Park, like we not we not up there with like Nepali or City, but like my junior and senior high school, I I interned with Social Security Administration. You know, I had a um I had like a, a really great uh, college counselor. Like and she, we we still feature this day. Her name is Keisha Fern. You know, she made sure like you know I got the best I can get. And, and at Forest Park, you know, like uh, before she, before like um, I met her, I met her my um, my sophomore year of high school and my junior, my freshman year, I never had no colleges coming up there, none took no college trips or anything. I never had no internships, but when I, when she got there, you know, came back there, like everything, everything in my life just changed, you know, as far as like me just like getting a different outlook of life. So like with me, I just want to like give kids opportunities, like get a different outlook, and people who want the opportunity, they would take it, you know. <laughs> No, that's beautiful, bro, because a lot of times we'll say they have no opportunities. You got to go out there and find the damn opportunities. Yeah. They not be coming to you, Malik. Yeah, definitely. And then when the opportunities come, we got to be humble enough to accept the blessings. Yes, sir. I want to ask you a serious question, Malik. Growing up, how many friends did you lose? As far as like in street violence or just the streets, like um, I definitely lost like a couple like kids I knew like growing up. Um, and I, that's like a sad reality where it's like um, like a lot of people like in Baltimore like like it's it's sad like I'm 25, but it's said like people like in 20, 25 they say they a young OG, and I feel like in other communities they don't really have to worry about that stress of like just losing people at like a young age compared to, like how kind of kids living like how growing up in Baltimore they like deal with or like so like be safe and like like. Stay safe out here. Like I don't see like you go in another community they have to really deal with that, that stress of like this people just dying, people just going to jail. Um and that that's like it take that take a lot of like our family structure away also, where you got like young men dying and then like, you know, young men going to jail. That's take a that's take a they might have kids or that might make young men like let's say for that a guy like, you know, he go to jail at twenty one, get out at thirty five, you know, that's a that's a lot of years, you know, you're trying to catch up with, you know, then you gotta look at if they have a child or they don't have a child, you know, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of like stuff you gotta take into consideration. So I think like our family system, that break down your family system, then it break down your economic system because you got men that's not 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 producing at a at a high rate, you know. So like, you look a lot of times, you know, like you might look at like different communities where like, you know, you got the earth man in our community, you got the white man in our community, but you know, you got the, you got the black man selling dope in our community. So it's like it's kinda like a, it's kinda like an imbalance, you know. How many of your friends have fathers. I mean, well, everybody got a daddy. 
Yeah. <laughs> but I'll see your daddy and everybody else see your daddy. Uh, yes, sir. How well, many I, of your friends don't have daddies? I know like a, a couple like my homeboys, they grew up, they didn't have like a dad in their life. But surprisingly, like some of them actually did, you know, like, um, and I, it's sad I got to see surprisingly, but like, I know like my, like my, one of my close friends, Malik, like his dad was like, you know, in his house, a two-parent household. And like, so I feel like even if you go down like the wrong path, you know, you're going to have like some type of structure to get you back on the right path compared to somebody that don't have nothing, you know. And one other question. I asked you how many friends did you lose? How many friends are in jail? Wow. I know like I had a, I had a, I had a friend I grew up named Alvin. Why? Well, yeah, his name was like Alvin. And since he, since we were like 15, like Alvin been in jail more than, more times he's been out of jail. And like he bought like 25, he bought like 26 now. So you look at like a like a 10, 11 year life span, you know, this man been in jail more than he been out of jail. And to you me, know, Malik, <clears throat> when I was 18, my mother said, you got to go. Actually, before I was 18, at 15, I was getting a memo. Uh -huh. I was getting emails in elementary school at 18, you have to go. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a little kid. Why are you telling me? Because 18 is just around the corner. At, at 17 and a half, I was getting my air, airplane ticket to leave Baltimore to go to Atlanta. Malik, between 18 and 21, those are some of the most crucial years for a young black man in Baltimore. And for me, I highly recommend getting our young people away to college, to the military, anything, just to go see something else. Because Baltimore is like a, a is like a meat grinder. If you ain't focused, you're gonna get caught up in that meat grinder and ain't nowhere but the graveyard and the jail. Oh uh, yes, sir. Okay, so let's let's big up our coaches. Who were your coaches? And you you know Coach Leon? Uh yes, sir. Well, I don't think he coached anymore. I know he had up to and he like he like a director there. Yeah, I, he was coaching when way back when I was a young man. So, I knew him to Leon since I was about 11, 12, and he all kind of like a good, it's a good person. Good man, solid yeah. man. Yeah. I think Dennis just passed, didn't he, Dennis? Yeah, Coach Dennis passed. Big ups to Coach Dennis. He was always on point. Um, yeah. Any final thoughts, Malik? I'm going to give you the screen. Anything you want to say to the world? Uh, yes. I would like um, – Right now, you know, I'm seven and zero with seven knockouts. Um, I want to represent Baltimore in a way, in a positive light. And like with that, like I would need support from my community and just like you know sponsorships, everything help like sponsorship, like purchasing a ticket, even like any in any in any way of shape and form, just helping me out as far as making me achieve my dreams. So once I achieve my dreams, I would achieve not just my dreams like with boxing, but just also community development also. So any any way shape and form, I would definitely appreciate my community help. Help is going to find you. Do you pray? <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, man, you keep God first. You're going to do anything but fail. I believe that in my heart. If you keep God first, if you pray before your match, if you pray before your community development project, your college thing, your work, your business, you give God the praise, you ain't going to fail. Hey, what that was, I want to know if, how much you know yourself. What does your name mean? My name man King. Oh, okay. I just had to check on you. Malik Titus, we're so proud of you. And to tell your daddy that I interviewed you. I just saw him yesterday. I said, we're going to interview <laughs> your son tomorrow. I'm proud of you, man, for representing our community. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you for having me on. They definitely meant a lot to me. Not just like for like promoting. It just meant a lot to me, like people looking like stuff that I'm doing. like, And not just like looking at, let's like, for example, like me, let's like, five years from now, they looking at me like Malik Titus today, and they got the potential, like, I'm going to become something special. And, like, that's, like, the main thing. Because, like, you know, a lot You're of already people, special. I appreciate that. And I have a prediction. Okay. I see you being a boxing announcer. I can see that. Because you got to do something after you box. And I see some of these people on it. There's nothing worse than seeing somebody on there 
I'm watching. I'm watching the May. Oh no, 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 no. I'm watching Tank. Tank, and this is a fight that's about a year old. Uh -huh. I get so sick of them announcers hating on our black boxers. This one particular fight, Tank said he was going to knock the dude out in the eighth round. <laughs> But it wasn't going, it didn't seem like it was going that way. But Tank knew what he was doing. But them boxing announcers who ain't never been in the ring, oh, Tank is down. Looks like he's going to lose on points. Next thing you know, Tank hit him with that left. I remember that fight. <laughs> was it a left? No, I think it was an overhand right. Yeah, it was an overhand right. And it's like he got him on the temple, knocked him down. Yes, sir. And everything changed. But I just get so sick of those announcers who ain't never been in the boxing ring and know everything and don't know nothing. Yes, sir. That's why we need you as a boxing announcer after your heavyweight career. Have you ever met Lennox Lewis? No, but I would love Lennox Lewis. And we got to make some of these things happen, man. We got to yeah. get you some people that can connect you to these people. But get outside of Baltimore and don't forget the, the banker, the accountant, the insurance, and the lawyer. And you trust your daddy, you trust your mama, but everybody else you got to verify. We got to run credit checks on everybody come around. I got you, brother. My man, Malik Titus, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Yes, sir. We appreciate it. My name is Donnie Glover. Do check out our websites, bemorenews.com, the news before the news where we uncover the truth. Next up is Mr. William Hanna Blue at 10 o'clock. We had Michael Haney earlier this morning with Wake Up Baltimore. Troy Rollins coming in at noon live from Los Angeles. And we have shows tonight. This is a busy night, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. 6 o'clock, you got Frontline News with Yolanda Bully. Then you got, oh, I'm sorry, Yolanda Pulley. And our whole cast of compadres, including Jason Rodriguez and Miss Tabron. Seven o'clock, we have Chap Davis and Queen of Chancy. They are our longest running show. They've been here since, uh, I want to say January 2021. So they're going in a couple of years now. And then uh, one of our new shows, Mr. Robert Washington with the Robert Report. My name is Donnie Glover. Good morning, world.